on the show? No. No, you can't. You think he won't like it? Yeah, he'll get sensitive and he'll cry. He'll get very upset. Like, I can't believe you said it about me. Well, I thought these people were my friends. Blah, 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 blah. And then he'll flip out like me. Start talking about Jose hates Wi Fi boosters. Yeah. Wi Fi boosters and Monte Cristo. We're live. Cigar Federation. Cigar Chat. Live with Jose Blanco, Joe White. <laughs> Are you there? Who, me? No. I mean, that's how we started. That's how we're starting this thing. Dude, we've been live. It's rolling. Oh, man. I didn't even know. <laughs> well, for everybody listening, it's, that's Seth. He's he's a little on edge tonight because uh, I was. you'll notice in the video and probably hear throughout the episode, his, he's using Wi-Fi. And, you know, in most places, you know, Wi-Fi, even hell, even where Jose's in the Dominican, has better Wi-Fi than Seth in North Carolina. And I was I am, busting I'm, his chops a little bit about it. I'm in like a bunker. This I'm, is true. In, I'm in like a bunker. Well, so, yeah. regardless, I was busting your chops, and then he basically just yelled at Jose Blanco. And just for no reason, just started yelling at Jose. Yeah, I think it's, uh, I don't know. I mean, I'm much older than him, but I think his old age is catching up with him. I don't know. I think so, too. Just, just He's gotten little, cranky. Just getting a little crazy. Just getting a little crazy. I think the Belgium trip and all that beer he had there got him going berserk. Yeah, it's probably. He was is... about to get a slap fight with Jonathan Drew. <laughs> this is true, man. I, this is true. Well, I didn't interrupt him during the speech. He got distracted. That's the true story. No, you you made a comment, which was hilarious. And then he's the kind of guy where once he gets on a roll, if he gets stopped, it completely derails the speech. And then the worst part was Charlie got involved. And then you and Char- you were more angry with Charlie for pissing or, fuck, or messing around with you than Jonathan. It, it was a complete – there's a reason I don't drink, and that that was the reason. That's the reason. That's the whole reason. That's but anyways, we're here. The way the cookie crumbles. So we're here. We're hanging out with a Jose Blanco. Rob's not with us. He's got work or some lame excuse. It doesn't really matter. So, Jose, it's been a while since we've had you on. How's it going, my friend? Everything is good. I just got back. I've been traveling for the last six weeks, like five. Uh, New York, Pennsylvania, Connecticut, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, Alabama, Tennessee, Georgia. Wow. Doing uh, seminars, spreading the love, and to be honest, really seeing how much people want to learn about cigars and how much people are enjoying cigars. I have to admit, we've talked about it uh, on, uh, off the air on it. A lot of people making some great stuff out there, and I always said that uh, we don't need more cigars manufacturers. We don't need more cigar shops. We don't need even more radio shows. What we need is better cigars, better manufacturers, and people do a great job like you guys do. Hey, you also stopped in North Carolina because you and I had some quality time, man. That yeah. sounded really yeah. bad. <laughs> Should he yell at you? It depends. It depends what you call quality time in North Carolina compared to uh, quality time in DR and quality time in uh, in the great state of Texas. This is true. We we smoked and we talked. That's all I can say. No, you know, it's always a pleasure for me to see you, Logan, and uh, you guys are, are you're honest, you're true, passionate uh, smokers. You you want to learn every day more, and both of you in, in different ways have, 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 have uh, added a lot of value to uh, uh, your blog, your business, and you have a good reputation because uh, for many years you've been doing it, and, you know, I bump into a lot of people, and... Uh, they have a lot of respect for you guys. Well, I appreciate that, Jose. They must wish be on I, drugs. I wish I could respect a lot of those people as well. Um, <laughs> so I got a question, Jose. We're going to ask some different questions. We'll get into the Senor Almaduro and the Senor Lancero, but I want to ask you a question. Seth and I talked a lot about, you know, how can we make this episode a little bit different? Because we've had John a lot of times, right? And we've talked about a lot of different things. First question is, who is the most famous person that you're aware of that has smoked one of your cigars that you know of? Have you had a president smoke one of your cigars? Have you had like a movie star? Who's the most famous person that smoked one of your cigars that you're aware of? And That's, not someone in the cigar industry. So you can't say like, you know. To be honest, I would say uh, Jim Bellucci. Really? really? Which one? Uh, he smoked. There's more uh, than one. Huh? There's more than one Jim Bellucci? Not, a, not Jim Bellucci, you know, which cigar? Oh, okay. You know that uh, Jim Bellucci and I, we go way back from my days in La Aurora when uh, we used to make uh, 
Lone Wolf for him and Chuck Norris. So, you know, he would always go oh, down. That's to, old school. Yeah, we, he would go always to La Rora, a real funny guy, really down to earth, always with his uh, cowboy boots, his Hawaiian shirt, always with a cerveza presidente. Then I would see him at IPCPR. Then I saw him in Chicago one time, and then uh, I had him uh, at one of my uh, seminars. But then uh, uh, Dan Aykroyd called him up, and then uh, he couldn't be there. Another person that I sat down actually for two and a half hours that really, really impressed me was Steve Harvey. He is the really? most funniest man that I've ever met in my life. It's funny because I was working in Chicago and the uh, manager of uh, Biggs Emporium calls the rep and says, are you guys going to stop by? There's somebody to see you here. And uh, wow. yes, we're all going to be there. And I said to uh, Ryan, no, that has to be uh, Jim Bellucci that's in town. So when I walk in, guess who's sitting there? Steve Harvey. So I go up to Steve and I tell him, Steve, can I have a photo with you? And he says, absolutely no. I say, like, okay. <laughs> nice. And then he says, I sent for you, man. I've been wanting to uh, to meet you. Sat down for two and a half hours. He was with one of his assistants. It was only me and him. We talked about his life, his cigars, his passion. He works 320 days a year. He, he told me how he started off, uh, how passionate he is, is about cigars. And he says that one of the things that bothers him the most is when he is publicly uh, smoking a cigar or uh, posts something on Facebook that people say, well, you know, don't smoke this or that. He says uh, he's been smoking, I don't know, for how many years, and the guy's down to earth. And after that, after about two and a half hours, he said, now you can have a photo. He took a photo. Then he took a photo. And then he put it on his Facebook. That's awesome. And But listen to this. And he said, after a great day of work, I spent uh, two and a half hours with Master Blender Jose Blanco. In 24 hours, it got 10,000 likes. So oh, I my mean, God. He didn't have to do it, but I'll tell you, he is he's really down to earth. Uh, he's the real deal. Steve Harvey, man, family cool. feud. Yeah, and that and that radio show he has in Chicago. I mean, the ratings on that—that's that's ridiculous. Are He's you got, talking about Big's Cigar Shop? Yeah, Big's Emporium. I, I was there. Fifteen thousand square feet. Could you believe that? The thing's awesome. That's I was there last week. That's a big shop. It is a big shop. It's a mansion. It's awesome. Chicago. Here's a you know this is question. Here you go. This is kind of cigar. How old were you when you first smoked a cigar? I just saw this one. How old were you, Jose? Because I was 13. Okay, so you started before I did. I started actually around 14, and we used to go to Hoji's father's uh, factory because in the summer, the, you know, we, we, we didn't work there, but we went two or three days a week, and, you know, we started to sort tobacco and things like that. That was the first time I saw original Piloto Cubano. And, you know, I, I lit up a cigar one day, and I liked it, and then there was a guy there at the factory who would make me, at that time, it would be no molds or anything. It would be maybe like a 6 by 35, 34. And my father caught me, which used to, everybody knows was smoke five, six cigars a day. He said, when you're 16, you can start officially smoking. But I kept on smoking here and there, you know, one or two cigars a week. And then after I was 16 till today, it's been... Uh, it's been smoking four or five a day. A little rule breaker, smoking Panatellos back in the day. Yeah, but I, I was doing it, to be honest, just to show off. I thought it was cool. That was during the summer times, though, not during like the school year, right? I know, but at that time, I think it was, uh, what's this guy's, uh, <coughs> Richard Roundtree, I think it is. He smokes, uh, he smokes a lot of Lanceros and Panatellos, and... And I think he did Shaft and a couple of movies, and I, I really, uh, I kind of went for that stuff. Shaft. What was oh, your yeah. cigar? What was my that, first cigar? Yeah. My that first cigar. Well, because then, uh, 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 what's his name, did it? Uh, uh, oh, oh, yeah, what's his, uh, wow, Samuel L. Jackson. Jackson. Samuel, Samuel Jackson was a good Shaft. I like oh, Shaft. Yeah, man, he was badass on that one. He was. He went against Christian Bale, man. Yeah. My first cigar, Logan, was an H. Upman Sir Winston. And this was back in 1999 in Budapest. I was just going to want to clarify that we do not 
condone underage smoking on this show. And when it happened, Seth was located in a country where there's no rules. Not the United yeah, States of it's, America. It's Eastern Europe in the late 90s. Uh, that's, Emma, hey, I'm just, I'm just Emma, clarifying, Seth. I'm just yeah, clarifying. Emma would know about that. Not everything that happened in Eastern Europe in the late 90s. Oh, yeah, exactly. It was, it was post-communism. Oh, yeah. It was crazy. Anything went, man. So, even the nukes. Even the nukes. Everything, even the nukes. Everything must go. Yeah, it was in H.M. and Sir Winston because my brother was, he was in boarding school in Massachusetts. Uh, so when he'd fly back, He'd pick up uh, Cubans in, you know, Switzerland um, or Germany, wherever he was flying in through. Um, then he'd bring some back. That's cool. My first was, cigar, I think I was like 20. What'd you smoke? It was something horrible. I think it was like a Romeo and uh, Romeo Juliet uh, Reserva Real or something horrible. Nice. Yeah. I don't know. Eh. So, Jose. Hey, there's, a, there's a lot of guys who like those, though. There's a lot of guys who like those. There's yeah. nothing wrong with that for all the viewers out there. That's just true. There's let's let's be perfectly <coughs> correct about it. Your favorite cigar is the one you're smoking. So, um, and a Jose, free one. And, and a free one, exactly. Okay. All right, Jose. Next next deep question. What has been a moment during your cigar history as a working for La Aurora, working for Hoya, or under your own brand with Las Cumbres and Senorau? What was a moment in which you were just like, oh, crap. I totally just screwed something up. You know, I was just like, oh, my God, I cannot believe that I did that. To be honest, saying, making, doing totally something crap or dislike. I don't mean I necessarily cigar-wise, but, like, you, like, ordered the boxes the wrong size for oh. the cigars. Like, something like that where you're like, oh, my God, I can't believe I did this. Uh, I think it might have been an order of something I got wrong, and it was actually, I think it was for our friends at CAO at that time with uh, Tim Ossinger. I think it was something that had to do with the, uh, with the CAO vision, I think. Oh, wow, yeah. I rem those are some cool humidor boxes. Yeah, and uh, I think that uh, the production that they ordered, I know there was one side that I think I totally forgot about it. I'm not sure. I can't remember, but uh, they had a lot of uh, problems getting the boxes in in time. And to be honest, and 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 Tim and I talked about, I never I never liked the idea of the uh, of the box because I thought it was like too too like disco. But I have to say, the cigar was phenomenal. It ranked on the top 25 that year. I remember number nine. It was uh, Dominican wrapper had piloto into it. I don't, I don't, I don't think it was 100% Dominican, but the cigar was very, very good. But I think we, I think I screwed up some size on, on some numbers. I think it was like 20 or 25,000. Well, I think I only put an order for 10, but you know, we, we, uh, we, uh, we made up for it because the boxes took time to. To get it in, but anybody who tells you they haven't ever screwed up is just lying because it oh, happens. The t man, the tor I like the torpedo of the vision. I remember that. That was is that the one with the white band? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It was the white band. Yeah. And it was numbered too, wasn't it? Numbered. It yep, was a numbered yep. band. Yeah. It was a good, uh, very, very good smoke. And to be honest, a lot of people bought them and they just took them out of the boxes and uh, it sold very well. Yeah, I don't remember the boxes, but I remember smoking that cigar. Yeah, the boxes, man, I remember those. They had the little LED light. Well, it wasn't LED. I don't know what it was. Like, a little blue light or something. You yep, push it, yep, it could yep. show the hum humidity inside. Hmm. That was... You man, know, gosh, what, what year? That, that's a what long time ago, man. 07? I think oh, man. I don't remember 07, 08. But, you know, they're talking about CAO, you know, when the Oskinger family had it. Tim, John Huber, those guys were very creative. And, I mean, they... I mean, the flavors, the Soprano, the CAO Italia, the Brasilia, the America. I mean, they were way ahead of their time with the concepts of uh, what they were doing. And, uh, you know. Uh, oh, the CAO Black. Remember that little Jackson Pollock style boxes? That was really mm -hmm. cool. Yep. That was really cool. I remember mm -hmm. that. That's old school. Yep, yep. They had some, uh, they had some great cigars out there. My fa one of my favorite cigars from them is from. 
my all-time favorite was when they were doing the extreme made in Costa Rica by Don Douglas and Victor Calvo. That's where Tony Borhani was making his cigars at that time. That cigar was, to me, what I call memorable. Which one was this? The C that's, cool. that's way before our time. CAO Extreme. I don't even. I don't think I've ever even heard of that. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's uh, then they changed factories, and that uh, unfortunately the cigar was not the same. Well, they they went with uh, the Toronios, didn't they? Yeah, they did with Toronios. They did with Nick. They did with another company. I can't remember what it was, but uh, and and the Brazilian. I like the Brazilian. There were some of them that were okay, but uh, they 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 did a good job. They're they were good marketing people, and people love uh, Tim and John and Eileen and and, and John Huber, which is which is phenomenal. He's, he's very creative, they, and Mike Condor, they've done a great job. They had a good team. They did. Yeah, they did. Very good team. Let me ask another question, Jose. Is If you were not in the cigar industry, what would you be doing for a full-time job? I don't know. I'd probably go back and pick up scrap in a factory. I can't be without the factory. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody, everybody knows I used to work for Brugat Rum five years. I mean, I did the beer, I did the cigarettes. Uh, I worked uh, with cold cuts with my father for many, many years. We used to have a factory. I know about a lot about salami, bologna, ham, uh, meat, and all that. But, I, but to be honest, I've told this a million times. If I were to die today and I go up there and St. Peter says to me, okay, we're going to send you back. We don't want you here. What do you want to be? You want to be an artist? You want to be a painter? You want to be a poet? You want to be a writer? I said, no, I absolutely, I want to be a cigar man. I think the cigar industry, in my opinion, is the greatest industry in the world. I'll tell you why. It's an industry where you're not judged by the color of your skin, your religious beliefs, or whether you're smoking a $2 bundle or you're smoking a $50 cigar. People don't give a rat's ass. People just enjoy. You network. You meet people. Of course, there's always going to be the uh, occasional asshole, but, you know, it's... It's very, very, very limited. I would say the majority of cigar smokers are great people, and the, and the majority of manufacturers, it's great people. Okay. It's a pretty diverse industry when you think about it. I mean, when you when you guys get when you get guys sitting down in the lounge, you guys got smoking a lot of different cigars. And it's, it's true. It, I mean, it's it's unique in that sense. Well, you I know. Think, yeah. The three of us have traveled a lot. I mean, Logan does a lot of traveling. Seth has done a lot of traveling. I've, I've traveled probably visit 50, 60 uh, countries. Uh, Emma's done been in maybe 70, 80 countries, and it's all the same thing. I mean, it's you just network, you meet people, and and people, especially when I go like uh, when first time I went to Hong Kong and in Shanghai, and I did seminars, and I went to Thailand. I mean, I was some people knew who I were, and I go like, you go to Shanghai, and five or six guys. You know, show up and they they tell you they know about you that I was with this company and that country, and some of them show me photos that of stuff they bought over the internet and things like that. It really impressed me, and it it makes you feel good. There's a there's a lot of people, especially in Asia, that want to learn about cigars, but they don't have a culture. The same thing uh, in uh, in you know in Saudi Arabia, Dubai. I have a couple of guys out there that are good friends that buy my products. And uh, it's amazing. Uh, the world has changed. Yeah. No. I mean, I agree. I mean, I mean, I think customer-wise, it's very diverse, right? But from the manufacturing side, you know, I don't think it's necessarily that diverse. You've got, you know, Latins, and then you've got gringos, and that's it. I mean, that that's really it. And I think there's a pretty good distinction between people who have grown up in it, and then people who are brand owners. I mean, it's it's kind of obvious to tell who those people are. But, um, but yeah, I mean, it is a pretty diverse industry. I mean, I've been to a lot of different places, and I've been smoking a cigar on a street corner or smoking a cigar in a shop or, you know, in the car, and it's it's something that can unite us all. I mean, I 100% agree with that. Um, Seth, you got to play on your phone all day, or what are you doing? Yeah, sorry, man. I was, I was uh, Instagramming it. So oh, you're you're giving your little spiel, man. So I know I was waiting for you to ask this enlightening question because we were talking about asking these deep questions that are different than what we ask every week, and you're not contributing. No, all right. You know, here here's a deep question, Jose. You said Saint Peter. Ask what you can do. You can't do cigars. That's not an option. Where does your passion 
what are, where are your other ho- you have hobbies you I'm got sure to you read, oh, I I'm love sure you read books well, what, what else do you love let's talk well, about it well one of my main things and I think I'm as knowledgeable in uh, on movies as I am in the cigar industry that is really my second passion is movies I can talk movies all day long and What's I, can your favorite back, movie? I can go back to the 30s up to date uh, about the greatest actors I'll tell you something I consider Sir Lawrence Olivier the greatest actor of all times you don't see guys like Spencer Tracy anymore you don't see a Gary Cooper you don't see uh, Clark Gable Marlon Brando uh, yeah. uh, Paul Newman uh, Peter O'Toole I mean oh man Peter O'Toole is a great actor yes is it Logan. Sad that I don't know any of these people. Dude, Peter O'Toole, Lawrence of Arabia. Dude, Lord. I don't watch no Arabia. Lord, oh, that's that's gosh. considered one of the ten greatest uh, movies of all time. The way no, I they they consider Citizen Kane the best movie of all time, and that movie is stupid. No, Citizen it's his Kane, freaking red wagon. Citizen Kane is a great movie. Lawrence of Arabia, The Godfather, Gone with the Wind, On the Waterfront. Uh, I mean, all great movies, man. What's but, your favorite? What's your favorite movie, Jose? It's uh, it's. I always consider Gone with the Wind and Citizen Kane. Then after really? that, Lawrence of Arabia, uh, The Godfather, On the Waterfront. I'm a big fan of The Usual Suspects. I mean, I think that. Oh, movie The Usual was, Suspects is an incredible movie. We Were Soldiers, Magnificent Seven. Oh, Magnificent Seven. Yeah, my favorite movie is. We don't care, Logan. Joe Dirt. Joe Dirt. <laughs> That's a great movie. No, it's a terrible movie. No, that's that's Lawrence, what, so awesome. Lawrence, Lawrence of Arabia is, is a is a really it's a, it's a classic. It is. It's uh it's brutal. Talk about a, talk about a guy that lost it. Oh, Shawshank Redemption's a terrific movie. That's a that's a that's an ultra good one. Morgan Freeman, I mean, he's an amazing actor. Oh, he's he's one of the he's one of the best. Paul Next Newman. Question. Paul Newman. Bob it's, Hope. Um, yeah, Jose, you know the movie, and Emma might know this, you know the movie Sunshine with Ralph Fiennes and Rachel Weisz? No, I, I don't remember that one, no. It was, it was filmed in Budapest, and it was filmed when I was in Budapest. Emma was probably still in Budapest. She, she, would, she should know this. And my mom and I bumped into Ralph Fiennes in, oh. a, uh, in, a, in a coffee shop. And... Um, you know, we walk in, and my mom's a huge Ralph Fiennes fan. I'm like, oh my gosh, that looks like Ralph Fiennes over there. My mom bolted right across the coffee shop. I mean, it was like total fan to to uh, spend that two seconds with Ralph Fiennes, um, which is pretty cool. It was it was cool meeting. Indeed. So, what kind of car, Jose? If you could drive any car in the world, doesn't matter what year it is, what would it be, and why? Oh, uh, he's speechless. Probably, uh, that's a tough question. I mean, it's uh, you know, people talk about Rolls and they talk about Bentleys and they talk about Ferraris and they talk about Porsche. To be you honest. Look like a- you look like a minivan type of a guy, Jose. No, 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 no. I would say, to be honest, I would like to drive the Range Rover. That would probably. Oh. That's a good choice. Land Rovers are pretty darn sweet. Range yeah. Rover, yeah. I All like discoveries, them. yeah. Mine would be an old Discovery Series Two, or I was obsessed with the movie Cruel Intentions back in the day, and I'd have a 1956 Jaguar Roadster, where you have to double shift. That thing is legit. Well, I'll tell you something. I think the greatest car chase of all times was Bullet. Steve McQueen. The Dodge and the Mustang. That's a good one. You know, that's a great scene. Scene with Steve McQueen isn't the Great Escape when he's riding the uh, motorcycle, the motorcycle in the Alps. That's a great movie scene right there. That's another terrific movie. Man, good times, good movies. 
Jose, so you grew up. I, not everyone knows your story. Give us your years, zero to eighteen, in a brief synopsis. Okay, uh, I was born in New York. Lived in Manhattan for a couple of years. Then we went out to live in Long Island. <clears throat> My father was a political exile. We had a dictator here called Trujillo from 1930-1931. The family got into politics. My grandmother got my father out when he was 16 or 17. I think it cost like $18, $20 to go to a boat, on a boat to New York. He arrived there. He learned English, became an American citizen, was in World War II for uh, four years, got wounded, a proud vet, had his business there, paid his taxes. Uh, came back. So we came back. Uh, I went to uh, Long Island. I remember to play in Aloysius. And I had a lot of friends there. Then in 1962, a year after Trujillo was killed, we came back here. I went to De La Salle. Uh, I, I, at that time, I loved horseback riding a lot. But all the time, I would love to go to see Hochi's father's factory. So all the time we were there, you know, smoking cigars and learning little by little. I started doing these little kinds of blend. But at that time, remember, it was basically a, a Piloto Cubano. At that time in, 60, I think, 64, 65, we started to get that sea. But basically, everything was allure. And then, you know, uh, you would have Indonesia. You would have uh, Connecticut. Uh, at that time, La Aurora, I think, was one of the first companies really, or the first company here in Dominican Republic to use Cameroon from the Metafel family. Which, by the way, I think the best rapper in the world is Cameroon. When it's really, when you have a good crop, it's a really dark, oily. You're gonna have that that sweetness that I don't think any tobacco in the world has as true Cameroon. It ha it's a combination of of uh, sweet and spicy because if you take Cameroon grown in Ecuador, it's gonna be spicy and earthy, and that yeah. tells you how rich the soil in uh, Cameroon is. And right now, grade A Cameroon is around 60 or 70. 60 to 70 dollars an hour, and there's a real worrisome. Uh, uh, a lot of people are saying that maybe in time, because it's so hard to grow tobacco in Cameroon, that uh, it might be something that uh, Cameroon from Cameroon might disappear. When was the first? When was the first time you smoked Cameroon? I would probably say 1970 something from La Aurora. So you, wow, you've been smoking that for 30 plus years. So you can see how much it's changed over the years. Oh yeah, without a doubt, without a doubt. It's uh, sometimes I see Cameroon wrappers on on some companies, and I know that it was it was just a bad crop. You see, it's very light color. It's not a lot of oils on it. I thought it was supposed to be light. No, I've seen Cameroon. Uh, I remember we used to at La Aurora get some Cameroon that it's amazing and. And some Cameroons from from the Fuente family that they get the first choice with the Metafel family that are really it's, it's amazing. The problem is that because the palates of people have changed so much, you don't hear so much so many people smoking uh, talking about Cameroon. But there's still a lot of people that love that sweetness of a of true Cameroon. So Cameroon was I mean Cameroon was big for many many years. Oh yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's 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 not as big anymore, and, and which happens over years. What would you say is is the big rapper now, in your opinion? What is what is the big rapper? Havana, Ecuador. Yep, San Andreas. I've always said right now, uh, and I've said this in the seminars. People ask me, and I tell them, Broadleaf always has a huge following. Negro San Andreas in the last three or four years have picked up, and and a lot of people are using Havana, Ecuador. And you, you, I mean, I know, Senor Al, you've used Habano Ecuador, and even the Maduro, you're using Mexican. What made you choose Mexican on the Senor well, Mexican? you know, the, the Turin family, they, uh, one of the cousins uh, parted ways and started growing, and Hochi, my cousin, for the last five or six years, is buying the entire crop from This year was 800, 800 bales of wrapper alone. So when we did the Senorial, we were looking at different uh, Senorial Maduro, looking at different options. So, you know, Hochi had this very, very old five-year-old wrapper. And I looked at what the production could be, and Hochi said, look, we have it there. And, you know, Hochi and I are not only first cousins, but 
you know, you know, uh, we're we're more than brothers. I sp I've spent more time with him than my own brother that uh, lives in Holland, which I, I only see every couple of years, even though we talk every week. But uh, uh, he was very generous uh, with us. It's like on the 65th anniversary, he had that, he had that rapper that uh, uh, from La Canela, a seven-year-old uh, rapper, and you know we made 20,000 plus cigars that we practically, I think we got like 70, 80 boxes left at the warehouse and some of the factory from some of the international market. But you know when it's gone, it's gone. I'm not going to do like some companies do, like you know they have a limited edition that goes on for five, six years. We're working on different things and. Uh, you know, it's for next year probably maybe uh, after March you won't be able to see a box of uh, 65th around anywhere unless somebody just just put them aside. Let me ask you a question, Jose. Is that you know you've been obviously in the tobacco world for a long time, and you've seen the ebbs and flows of this wrapper's possible, this you know this change, ring gauges have changed, strength profiles have changed, taste flavors have changed. What do you think has been the most dramatic shift in a tobacco, you know, whether it be wrapper or filler, from the time you started until now? The big sizes. Really? I never, I never thought I would see a cigar 7x70, 6x80. And it's funny you mention it, but it was a couple of years ago, you know, all the newcomers, and I feel flattered, they come over to me, they bring me, you know, two or three cigars with a, with a card, and they said, you know, Mr. Blanco, when you have time, please, you know, smoke it, tell us what you think. And I remember a couple of years ago, they asked me, what is a cigar that you would not do that you think it could work? And I said, it's very easy. Make a cigar, 10 by 100, put a big band on it, and call it enough. <laughs> that's awesome. So you think that's the biggest change, like, in terms of the industry, like, where you never thought it would go, even starting out 40 years ago? I would, to be honest, I think that's one. And, you know, and a lot of people just might not uh, uh, know this or remember this, but the person that really started uh, doing the 54 and the 56 was Ernesto Perez Carrillo when he was at La Gloria. La Gloria, yeah, La Gloria. Yeah. Bigger ring gauges, I remember wow. those. That was a huge, I mean, I don't know how many millions of cigars they made. I think with the production of the Series R, I don't know. I could be mistaken, but I think it was four or five million cigars a year on that on that line alone. It's amazing. It's funny that that he was him because I feel like he's pressed the boundaries a lot of with a lot of the inch and stuff like that. Is he's on the top of the scale with a lot of the stuff he produces now? Like I think one of the inches was like sixty-eight or something ridiculous. But yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the inch is what sixty-four. I mean the the medium size. It's you know. I think they're they're gigantors. Yeah, they're big. It's crazy. I mean, I remember. I mean, I mean, starting smoking and really, really smoking in two thousand six, two thousand seven. Sixties were like that was before sixties, so it was interesting to see the fifties start increasing in numbers. The next thing you know, you have these sixties, and you're like, wow. And then it's just look where it's come now. Sixties are just like, geez. But it's interesting with everything going up, though, a lot of limited editions, and I, Jose, I'd like your opinion on this, a lot of limited editions that guys release are smaller ring gauges. We see a lot of limited editions being Lanceros, and if you look at, and this is my thing, but if you look at a lot of limited editions coming out of Cuba, a majority of the time, those are bigger ring gauges, and it's interesting to see the differences in those two, I think. Yes, and uh, to be honest, I think... What I've seen this year, what I see on social media, what I see at the events, I see a lot of people going down. I went to an event in uh, in Atlanta, and the last time I was there last year, there was two guys that came in, and I remember at the event they bought two boxes of Legrand six by sixty. And this year, when I went to do the event, they split a box of the Toro seven uh, six by fifty four, and I said, "What happened? No more Legrand?" And they said, "No, you know." After doing the seminar and things like that, I'm more conscientious on the on the 54, and uh, we're scaling down. And you know, we've learned to smoke lanceros and petit coronas and corona gordas and robustos. So I think maybe for next year we might see a a little decrease on the big ring gauges, even though, and I I think I've shared this before at seminars and maybe on the show. About a year and a half ago, I asked bloggers, consumers, and retailers. 
what their thoughts was on the big ring gauges. And, all, and, the, and the number one uh, answer was, it's a value thing. It is a value the thing. thing. was a macho thing. And the third thing that came up, it's an American thing. I was going to say an American thing, yep. You like everything big. And then another misconception that people have, and I clarify that, because a lot of people in the seminar says, well, it, it smokes cooler. And I said, if a cigar is well made, it doesn't matter if it's a 4x30. It's going to smoke cool. It's all about construction, the quality control, and the consistency from the factory. So uh, it's not about it's a, a cigar that's well made. It's going to smoke well in, uh, in any size. That's my personal opinion. I would. I mean, I agree with that. I mean, the problem is a lot of the smaller sizes people smoke too fast, so they say they smoke bad. It's kind of hard to smoke a six by sixty too fast. Oh, you know, yeah, you'd have to be. You'd have to be pumping, pumping. That'd be well, huffle puff. Well, it's something I ask at the seminars. I said you have a five by fifty, and if I have thirty people at the <coughs> seminar, I ask them how long it takes you to you get be a different answer. 80% 80, 80 of the people say 45 minutes to an hour, but I've had people say 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 35 Jeez. minutes. And then I ask them, do you complain sometimes about bitterness and sourness? They said, yeah. I said, look, if you slow down, and even 45 minutes, it's on That's the fast. board. That's pretty quick, I think. I know. I think, to be honest, but, you know, you have cigars that are slow, what we call slow burners. You know, a cigar with a Connecticut uh, wrapper or Cameroon, is gonna on a five by fifty is gonna smoke uh, a little bit faster because it has the Leslie Heddles and Visos in it. Yeah. If you take a five by fifty uh, with a uh, Corojo ligero, a lot of Corojo into the filler, maybe a Viso in the uh, on the wrapper, and you know that if you smoke it correctly, it's an hour, hour and ten minutes smoke. Yeah. Yeah. Most fiber boosters take over an hour. So, tell us a little bit, Jose. I mean, we've talked about a lot of random stuff, but you know, for the trade show this year, you kind of kind of had two major projects. You had the the Senor Almaduro and then the the Senor Lancero. Tell us a little bit about the Senor Lancero. Well, you know, it's uh, you know, for during we started the project for Senorial, people saw me smoking uh, Lanceros and Lanceros being made, and this is the way we handle it. We could have come out at the show. The year before, but I wanted to make it was it was only ten thousand cigars, and uh, I said I want to make a lancero, and to prove to a lot of people that you can make a lancero that's going to draw well, it's going to burn well, it's going to be overall a lot of flavor and complexity. So after the cigars were made, we left them there for a year to rest. So it's going to come out twice a year, maybe ten thousand or eight thousand on this one, and maybe ten thousand on the other one. It has a following. We have some boxes left in Miami, not a lot. And uh, it has done very, very well. I mean, there's people like at Wooden Indian, that when it arrived, they might, I think, ordered eight boxes. There was like five guys that bought the whole box. I mean, to buy a box of Lanceros with 48 cigars. That's a big commitment. That's a commitment right you there. You really have to love the size. But more than the size, you really have to... Uh, Love uh, the blend, and I mean, you rated it one of these days, and uh, it got a very high score with you, and uh, we thank you for it. But uh, it's an amazing smoke, but it's a cigar that you have to smoke it slow to really enjoy it. Yeah, it's it's a really good cigar. Dave Meyer's got a good shop too, and he's got good customers. So if they're buying the Lanceros, there's a reason for it. Which I agree. I mean, it's it's a big box, but that's true commitment. Test of the cigar. It's true. Question, Jose, is that you? You mentioned something interesting, and I, I've always wondered about this, and I'm going to ask you because I know you'll give me a straight answer. But on the Lancero, you basically said, you know, it's a cigar that you really have to slow down and smoke to appreciate. Well, and maybe I'm biased against most cigar smokers, but I think probably 80% of them have really no idea how to smoke a Lancero properly. Or know that hey, on maybe something with a small ring gauge with a lot of lajero in it, you might want to dry box it for a little bit before you actually smoke it, right? Because it might be a little wet, it might be a little humid, right? So, do you ever? And this is my question: Is it do you ever? Are you ever concerned that wow, this is a really great cigar, but it's going to take some extra finesse from the smoker 
to actually enjoy it because if they smoke that Lancero too fast, they're going to think it sucks. So do you ever worry about, wow, I mean, if I put this out, like, I, I risk people thinking it sucks because they're going to smoke it improperly. To be honest, it's a, it's something that, you know, M and I, uh, you know, she's she's very picky and she goes into details about everything. It's something not only on Lanceros, you know, uh, a Corona, a Corona Gorda, some Robusto. And that's why the part of my education is to really uh, educate people about smoking because people in their minds, they think that the flavor is in the leaf. And absolutely, it's not in the leaf. It's the essential oils that the filler, the wrapper, and the binder have. So when you're putting all that heat through it, the essential oils are just evaporating, and it's like smoking paper. That's why I tell people you have to slow down. One of the things I ask people is before you smoke a cigar, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? People say, oh, satisfaction, what I'm going to pair it up with, who I'm going to smoke it with, the way I'm going to cut it, the way I'm going to do this. I said, all wrong answers. People look at me like I'm from Mars. What do you mean it's a wrong answer? I said, the first thing you do before you light a cigar is how much time do you have? Right. I mean, you're not going to buy a Churchill 7 by 50 and if you only have 45 minutes to smoke it, two things are going to happen. You're going to smoke the whole cigar in the 45 minutes where the speed limit is 60, you're going to do 120 or you're going to smoke half of the cigar, you're going to put it down at the shop or in your house or throw it away and five or six dollars went to waste. You gotta learn to smoke Rothschilds, Petit Coronas, Robustos, uh, Corona Gordas, Corona Larga, whatever it is. But the first thing as a consumer, as a person that really wants to enjoy a cigar, is to really look at your watch and say, how much time do you have? There's a lot of companies that have brought out those half Coronas. I think oh, yeah. one, of the ones, oh, yeah. one of the ones that's doing uh, very, very good one is my good friend Abe Flores. Uh, with uh, the half Corona box, and I see a lot of people buying it, and I've asked them why that. It says, well, you know, it's a 35 to 40 minute smoke. It's really good. It's I good don't for have a commute. For I don't have time, you know, to smoke an hour, an hour and a half, and I need to have my. Uh, I have to enjoy my cigar. It's a good commuter cigar. Yes, it is. And they're fairly inexpensive, so if you do get to work faster than you want or whatever. It's not like you're throwing out a ten dollar Churchill. So, so another quick question. You said Corona Lago or Largo. What size is that? I've never heard of that. It's a large Corona, man. It's a large. Yeah, it's, it could be it's five. Like Six forty-two. No, yeah, it could be five three quarters by uh, by uh, by forty-two. Yeah, because actually Corona, the size for Corona is actually five and a quarter by forty-two. Five and a quarter. I thought it was five and forty-two. No, five and a quarter by forty-two. But you know, ever, hmm. everybody here makes up things. If you look at the size of Churchill on the Cuban standard, it's, it's 749. Seven no, not seven 49. By 47. That's a double Corona, man. 7 by 47 is a the Churchill size on the Cuban standard. Okay. Always go by the Cuban standard. Yeah, no, um, it's not I about will. the Cuban <laughs> standard. Really, you know. But, you know, we, we, you know, we make up all types of name. We call it El Gordo. I mean... If you look at it, the six by sixty. It's it, what really is a six by sixty? Gordo, Grand Grand Toro. Yeah, Grand Toro. We call it Legrand. You know, it's everything is different. Everything has changed, and you know, ch change is, uh, has brought a lot of excitement into the uh, cigars. I mean, look how many guys have come out, you know, with a uh, with a lot of concepts and names and things like that, and it's worked. At the end of the day, for me, what I want is people to enjoy, have a great time, learn about cigars respect cigar uh, makers and respect, you know, fellow uh, consumers. I dis really dislike when I go to a shop and this guy who thinks he knows it all walks into the shop and always picks on the guy, why are you smoking that shit? Well, the guy's always kind of shy or something and, well, because I like it. No, if it, somebody would go into the shop and ask me why are you smoking this piece of shit, I would say, you know why, because I just paid $10 for it and I like it and so-and-so made it and I have a lot of respect for him. All right. So here's here's a question, Jose. You said that, and I and I agree, is that the cigar industry from, you know, even six seven years ago, is a lot more exciting, right? I mean, there's a lot of new concepts and brands, and people are coming out with new stuff. But do you feel like it maybe is a double-edged sword that's a, attracted the eye of the FDA from a regulation standpoint because there is so much new stuff and 
hip stuff coming out. Do you think that's part of the reason the FDA no, has their I sights on it? I think the anti-tobacco Nazis, as my good friend uh, Tommy the Z-Man calls them, they just they, they have it out for us. But if you look at it, and I tell you, that's why I think the country's so screwed up. Has anybody ever heard of somebody walking into a shop, smoking two cigars, getting on the highway and killing ten people? Absolutely not. But then you have a guy that goes to the that's in his house, has uh, six uh, beers, uh, lights up two joints of pot, gets high and goes on the highway and uh, does a massacre. And nobody, you know, nobody talks about that. I've said it for years and years. Smoking is not about health. Smoking, it's about rights. If you can die for your country at 18, you should be allowed to smoke and drink at 18. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. Uh -huh. I amen. will agree with you. <laughs> but I, and I also think, and we won't get into the FDA stuff now because that's probably way, way longer of a conversation. But um, you know, I, I, I think a lot of people just don't really understand cigars. I think that's part of the problem. But um, you know, with, I mean, with that, Jose, I mean. Let me ask you, I mean, not to get into the FDA stuff, because, I mean, who knows what's going to happen. There was a whole kerfluffle on the Internet between somebody <laughs> posting. So, yeah, it's it's basically a, better, a way I could say complete cluster F without, you know, cussing. But, you know, someone saw this on some vape site and all this. You know, let me just ask you straight up. I mean, what is what is in the next 30 days, what is in store for premium cigars? To be honest, that would be like that that uh, show back in the '60s, the sixty-four thousand dollar question. There's so many so many things. I saw a press release that says that the vape people said they're going to go from option one. Some people say it's going to be option two. I personally think a lot of that is going to go into uh, courts and lawyers, and uh, that could probably go to the Supreme. Because if you look at it, you cannot compare the cigar business, which around the wholesale is around seven. To 800 million dollars compared to the cigarette industry that's close to 90 billion dollars. So uh, why pick on uh, the small business mom and pop shops? If you look at it, 95% of the shops is it's is the hubs, husband and wife, or it's the uh, that husband with a part-time guy to work some slow day so he can go out and play golf and maybe see a movie. But it's all about small business. I mean, it's uh, I think it's uh, it's a big and you know what people don't realize is that you know now they're picking on us, and uh, they're not going to stop there. They just want to tell us you know what to do and uh, our ways and all that. And I mean the land of the home and the free is uh, not so much the land of the free anymore. They want to dictate everything on you. It's I mean we don't target minors. You walk to a shop and if uh, you have a baby face, the uh, the owner or the clerk is going to card you. And if uh, if you're not uh, 18 and in some places 19, 20, even up to 21, they're not going to sell you a cigar. And I mean, it's it, it is what it is. And then a lot of people think that you know, kids who are 20 and 21 years old, they can go and buy a 12 dollar cigar. Absolutely not. They don't have the money for that. Nope. It's basically cigarettes. Yep, it's very true. It's very very true. So, you know, I, go ahead, Seth. I was going to say I have a very controversial question here, which is no, going to start a huge. Why is it, Jose? That some of the best new releases this year are coming out of the Dominican Republic. Whoa, 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 whoa! I'm just saying. Let's look at the 2015 releases. And I'm gonna name, and I'm gonna name five cigars right now. And and I honestly think these are probably some of the best cigars released this year out of the DR. <laughs> La Florida Dominicana Lenox. Why did you say that? I smoked one yesterday. All right. I smoked one. It's good. Matilda Oscura. I've not smoked that. Senor Maduro. Very good. That was, that's an excellent cigar. I don't know who makes that, but that's a damn good cigar, man. The new Davidoff Winston Churchill. And here's a here's a here's a complete one. Very very new, very new Camacho the Camacho American Barrel Age. All of these releases, Logan, are so different. And when you look at a lot of this stuff coming out of Nicaragua, it's just the same thing. I disagree with that. Because first of all, you're talking about cigars. I, I don't think it's necessarily where the cigar is released or where it comes out of, right? Like, But it's example. it's the blenders in that country. Why is it that some of the exciting stuff? I think Dominican Republic's making a comeback. 
I'm not saying the Dominican's not making a comeback. I'm just saying it's not like they're making a Dominican Puro, right? They're using other rappers from other countries. They're using Nicaraguan tobacco. So it's not like it's a Dominican Puro. But I can I know, that, I'm not saying Dominican Puro. I'm just saying that the talent seems to be in the Dominican Republic. No hablo inglés. Yeah, no, see, no that, see, no one wants to. He doesn't want to get bought. I'm just saying. No, to be, honest, to be honest, uh, we have had for the last couple of years a lot of excitement. I think that, uh, you know, a lot, a lot of people, uh, we still are the number one producing country in the world. Nicaragua is second, and uh, Cuba has fallen down to third place with 90 million cigars uh, last year. I don't know what the numbers are going to be oh, this they, year. Oh, they don't even know what the numbers are. They make them up. Yeah, they just... <laughs> But one thing I can tell you, because and I mean, all, the three of us travel, I mean, I'm amazed. I never thought, I'll, I'll give you an example. When I went to Hong Kong for the first time, I thought, yeah, it's all going to be Cubans. I was amazed to see Oliva, to see Fuente, to see La Aurora, to see Davidoff. I think I saw something from Alec Bradley. Uh, couple of, I think I saw in one place some of Rocky stuff. When I went to Shanghai to Lily Shop, I mean, she had La Aurora, she had Fuentes, she had Oliva, she had uh, Davidoff, she had uh, she had around eight or ten different the brands. And to be honest, when I did the seminar and I interacted with the the guys, uh, they said that. Uh, they uh they were very happy with the consistency of cigars from Nicaragua and uh, and uh, yeah. the Republic. It's hard to, it's hard to pay fifty dollars for a cigar and you clip it and it doesn't draw. This is true. <laughs> it's true. You know that Cuban construction. It's that's no why, good. That's why I stopped smoking stuff out of rice. Is Cubanas. <laughs> um, I'm just saying, Dr. It's the year. It's the year of the DR, eh? Mm-hmm. Yeah. We will see. We will see. And you know how we'll know? The half-wheel consensus. <laughs> They'll tell us everything we want to know. We'll be bamboozled. We will be bamboozled, I'm sure. Um, I'm just saying that people, to all the people watching, I know Nika's very hot. I know people always very look at it because they think it's very boutique. Um, pay attention to the Dominican Republic. There's a lot of good stuff coming out of there. And I'm not just saying this because Jose's on. I have discovered this last night. I was smoking another Matilde Oscura, and I had smoked a La Flor Dominicana Lenox, and I was like, wow, Dominican Republic. We're seeing some some really exciting new things from old names. I mean, Jose Seas and, and you know, the, the Gomez, Lito Gomez and his son, I mean, it's not like they're brand new. They've been around. Oh, yeah. But, you know, you have to look at it also. You know, if you go back in the day, Dominican Republic, you know, always use uh, tobaccos from Cameroon, from Nicaragua, tobaccos from Brazil, tobaccos from uh, from Peru. They were more into blending cigars. I like, uh, of course, everybody likes a puro, but to really do a puro in the Dominican Republic, there's not been th though th that many that have been really successful. If you look at it, the, the three most successful Dominican puro cigars, absolutely open. Cien Años. Cien Años, I mean, one of the best cigars oh, that's I've a great ever cigar. smoked. Uh, and uh, the Lito Gomez Diaz, I mean, those cigars, oh, yeah. you could uh, stack them up against any cigars in the world and they will uh, they will, uh, they will, will glow, they will shine by themselves. Oh, yeah, Dominican, when, when you make a great, and I always say, you can make an okay Nicaraguan puro and you can make a crappy one and you can make a, a, a bad one, but for the most part, you can make a pretty decent one. You know, but I think when you get to countries like Honduras and, and, and you know, with Honduran tobacco and the DR, it is hard to make a really great one. But when you do make a great puro uh, with it all Dominican, all Honduran, it is fantastic. It is oh. simply fantastic, and it's it's to a higher caliber than a than a Cuban puro and a Nicaraguan puro. I gotta tell you something, man. And, you, I, I, and I've said this many times. I'm not a big. Uh a fan of all tobaccos from Honduras, but I go back to the days when my good friend Christian was doing the diploma, the mm -hmm. 1118. Those oh, yeah. cigars were phenomenal. I mean, that, that phenomenal. was years ago, but that was, I mean, that was phenomenal cigar. 
2003, 2004, 2005, 6. I mean, that Camacho Corojo, I mean, that cigar was amazing. And it's a cigar that ages very well. It has that Cubanist notes to it, uh, yeah. full flavor, full body. I mean, amazing cigar. But um, other cigars from Honduras, I'm not, I'm, to be honest, I'm not a big fan of it. Yeah. So we've got about a minute and a half left, Jose, before we go to our After Dark segment. So leave us with some parting thoughts. Give us one chunk of wisdom we should know, and then tell everyone uh, where they can find you on social media and where they can uh, connect with you. Well, one of the things I always tell people is never judge a cigar by the color of the wrapper. Respect and don't badmouth the cigar because somebody liked it, somebody took the time to make it. Join CRA. Be part of the fight. If you're a tobacconist, join IPCPR. When there's a petition in the show at, the, at your shop for the raising of taxes or smoking bans or FDA, write to your congressman, write to your senator, your state senator, your, your U.S. senator, and be part of the fight. Uh, don't let your rights be taken away from all this political uh, incorrectness. I think that fast food has done more harm than cigars to anything out there, and uh, nobody complains about it. And for those people who love fast food, that's the sec that's the next thing they're going to go after too. So if you like your uh, whatever brand of hamburger is out there, you know, look out that one of these days they're going to say that uh, they're going to ban that too. And anybody who follows me, they can find us at our website, Las Cumbres Tabaco, where you can. Get all the information on Señorial, uh, Freya that's done extraordinary well, Señorial Maduro. Follow me on Twitter, Jose Blanco 809, uh, Facebook, Jose Blanco, also on Instagram, Jose Blanco 809. And many of you guys, every day, there's not a day that I don't receive eight or ten uh, inboxes on my Facebook, on direct messages on Instagram, and also on Twitter asking me questions. I might be delayed by a day, but I always answer everybody back who tags me on anything on social media. And uh, M and I are always uh, open to uh, to help anybody and uh, to give uh, any type of education we can. Awesome, Jose. Well, we appreciate you coming on as always. So everyone, you can check us out. Uh, check out Jose, all the places he listed. You can check out any of the Senior Al Cigars, Los Cumbres Cigars in the Cigar Federation store. Uh, we'll be back next week. Um, I have no idea who we'll be with because I haven't really looked that far ahead. And just appreciate everyone listening on the AFRN and listening on the podcast. And we'll see you next week. Thanks, guys. Adios.